It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Robert Geislinger. So when I was younger, I played a lot of role-playing games, whether it be on the console or even in person. On the console, I had things like AD&D Pool of Radiance and Zelda and Dragon Warrior. And in person, we had Dungeons and Dragons and Vampire the Masquerade. Well, eventually that moved into board games. And today I'm going to take a look at a board game that I'm hoping might recapture some of that old feeling that I had sitting around the table. Today I'm going to take a look at Widower's Wood, which is a board game that's set in the Iron Kingdom's universe. So here we're taking a look at Widower's Wood. This is a game set in the Iron Kingdom's universe. And as such, if you've played Undercity before, which is the in the same game system, you'll already be familiar with the basics of the rules for this particular game. In this game, you're going to be a group of heroes who are going to be working through a campaign or an epic story. And each campaign is going to be set up a little different. Here we have the setup of the board for the first story of the campaign, but I've moved things around just a little so that I can explain things a little better. Now there is a lot in this box and I couldn't get everything on camera. You'll also notice that there are some enemies here as well as enemies out on the board and you'll notice that they come in two colors. That is because when doing spawning and activations, the color priority can matter. This is considered the reserves of monsters that will feed into the board when you need to spawn, and these will be the monsters that you are currently trying to defeat. These out here are your hero miniatures. At the beginning of each round, the player is going to draw a card from the event deck that's going to have something that happens. Now, hopefully, here we got lucky and it's ominous silence, so nothing happens. But sometimes you might get some characters gaining plus one defense against range attacks. Sometimes you might have a patrol happen. Well, whatever, it's going to cause something that happens. In addition, it's going to set the color priority for that particular round. After that is resolved, then the first player in initiative order is going to take their turn. The character sheets themselves have an initiative, and that is always going to be the order that characters will go in. The character is first, the player rather, is going to roll two dice, and one of those dice is going to determine the monster that's going to spawn, and the other is going to say where it's going to spawn. On the board, we have these numbered locations. So in this case, we're going to do a four, and over here, the three, four, five, and six are all the spear bog trolls. So we know that we're going to be doing one here in position three because of this die. The way that's determined is based on first here we have reds and blues, they're even numbered. If there was more of one than the other, that is the one to come out. Next, we would look at color priority, in which case it's currently blue, so we're going to spawn a blue one right here. After this, the player is then going to do their movement and action. Now, they can do it in either order, and, but there are three different types of movement. The first type of movement is simply a hold. Now a hold means you're going to stay put. A charge, you're going to get to go up to two spaces towards an enemy or something like that. And then a walk is you're gonna move one space. Now a walk you can do at any point, but the other two are important because a hold is also going to allow you to aim when you do a range attack. And that means you're gonna get to roll an additional die for that. A charge means that you're going to run up into an enemy and do their attack, but you're going to get to roll an additional die when you roll for damage. Once you've declared what you're going to do there, then you're going to take your action. Now, typically, the action is going to be an attack of some sort, but it could be something else, such as a spell or special action that you have access to, either through an ability or a feat card. In the case of Vaxus over here, he does have spells that are available and that could be a razor win or a mend or a curse of shadows but let's say that he does his razor win that's a range attack well he is here and it has a range of two so he could go 
to this space or this space or this space. There is no line of sight. It's more based on range, roughly. So you can go diagonal provided there's nothing blocking. Certain types of terrain will block on the corners for purposes of movement and attacks. But if he decided to attack, say, this guy right, well, he couldn't attack this because with a range, you can't attack in two. So we'll, uh, a space that has a character of your alignment with it. So let's say he decides to attack to this guy. What's gonna happen is he's going to first roll to try to take out that character's defense. Now that is a bog, tro a bog trog who has a defense of 11. So he's gonna roll two dice. He's gonna take those two values, add them up to his accuracy for it, which is a five. We have eight and 11. And you have to meet or exceed. Well, it so happens that bog trogs have a defense of 11. So he does do that. Next, he's gonna then see how much damage he does. The same thing here, he's gonna roll two dice unless he has something that's upping the number. And he's going to add that to his power, which here is a 7. So that's going to give him 10, 14. Well, they have a armor of 12, so he does make a hit on them. Now, there are two types of hits. There are regular hits and super hits. A regular hit simply means that you do one point of damage. A super hit means two. A super hit means that you have done damage to them of five or greater over their armor. But since the Spear Bog Trog only has one hit point, this would kill him. He would move back into the reserve and the players would gain one XP for, for the damage that was done. In addition, you will have other types of monsters that do have more than one hit point, such as this Mist Speaker, and in which case they will be tracked using hearts the same way player's health is tracked. After the player has done this, now he chose a walk and then do that, he can still do his movement, so let's say he decides to move here. That'll end his turn, he will draw a feat card. Now I didn't explain feat cards. Feat cards are basically uh, extra abilities that you can do during your turn, such as here where you could boost. Play this card to boost one of your rolls. If he had done that before, he could have added an additional die to the roll. Feet cards are discarded upon use, and at the end of your turn, you will draw one feet card. You have a maximum that you can have at any time of three. After this, now the villains get to, to have an action. So you're going to draw a villain action card, and that is going to say what will happen. So here we have a remote rumble. Activate the villain farthest from you. So so from the active, we're going to figure out which one is furthest from him in terms of moving towards him. Now we see that this one is one two away, so that's not him. This one here does have amphibious, so he would treat these water spots as regular terrain, but this will cause where he can't go diagonal because of this. So he would go one, two, three, four. So he's four that way and one, two, three, four that way. So he's going to be four out. This guy is going to be one, two, three. This guy, on the other hand, is one, two, three, four, five. This would be the one that's furthest out. Now, if there are multiple enemies that fit this, you would need to go through a color priority first. And then if that still doesn't break the tie, you look at the activation priority with a lower number having a higher priority. If you go through all that and you still can't figure it out, even using the text at the bottom of the card to break a tie, then the active player just decides which one moves. So in the case of this, this one is the one that's going to activate, and we're going to look at its card. At the bottom of its card is going to be what it does, and the game does include a reference sheet for what their icons do. So first, this monster would try a melee attack. Well, there's nothing in his space, so he wouldn't do that. Then he would try a rush. Now this one says that he has to move up to two spaces and end his movement in a target hero space to then try to do damage. Well, there's nothing within two spaces. So we go to his last icon here, which is called Pursue. If the target hero is within three spaces, the villain walks towards it. So if he was within three, he would simply move one space, but he's not, so he will charge, which means he will get to move two spaces. So he he could go one, 
two. At that point, that player's turn is done and play moves to the next player in initiative order following the same set of rules. Now, as I said, the game does have this campaign book and each campaign you're playing will lay out what your win condition is for that particular scenario. In this particular one, we're trying to take out four misspeakers before spawning these two gator men who we will then need to defeat. Players track their health using these hearts. They will have special abilities on their particular sheets that they can use that will help them. And the characters are pretty well built. Um, they do have multiple stats on them. Most of the time what you're worried about is vitality, defense, and armor because this, that is what you're trying to beat when, when you're rolling on, a, on against a monster and it's also what the monsters are trying to do when they're attacking you. They also will make the same sort of die rolls. And in fact, outside of their activating from the cards, the monsters really act in the same way heroes do. Now that doesn't cover everything in this game, but it does give you a general idea idea of the way the game plays. In addition, once you complete a campaign, then you are able to spend the experience points that you've gained to try to get ability cards, and each character comes with a huge deck of ability cards that they can buy with that experience. That'll allow them to be better equipped for the next campaign. In addition, one other thing to note is there are side quests, and these are going to be in a space on the board, and they'll have something else that you need to test or maybe get some loot, things like that. Game will go round and around like this until either all of the players have been rendered incapacitated. And one note on that is if one player is incapacitated, other players can come to them and give aid using these tokens in order to get them back on their feet. If on the other hand, you manage to get through the campaign to its victory condition, then you are the winner and set up for the next one. So that's a look at Widower's Wood. Now at the beginning of this, I did pose a question of whether or not this would capture that sense of adventure and role playing that I had when I was younger. And in that, this game does succeed for me. It really does give me that feeling that I had back when I was sitting around a table playing a D&D &D campaign with friends on these paper maps and things like that but I'm not completely convinced that that's a good thing here. So let's start with the artwork. Now, the cards and the character artwork, all of that is wonderful. The miniatures, I absolutely adore in this game. One thing that I was concerned about in this game was the board, because it almost as a little blob. Now, don't get me wrong, this board is a lot better than what I've seen in the spiritual predecessor to this game, Undercity, where that board was definitely less than spectacular. However, this board still is kind of overwhelming. It's definitely more interesting, but once you set it all up, it still is kind of blah in comparison to everything else at the table. So it gives me the feeling of the maps that we use when we play Dungeons and Dragons. However, keep in mind that was 1997. Another thing that drew me back to the old days for me was the gameplay itself. Now, I think this system is simple enough to learn. I'm just not sure how well it fits in today for modern board gaming. For me, it just seemed like a lot of rolling dice to break an armor and then do a damage. And while that's appropriate to the game, it feels a little tedious in the fact that you're double rolling these hits. Again, it's appropriate to the theme. In addition, the system that's here for controlling the AI, I was not a fan of. I thought it would be. It's innovative. It allows for someone to not be running the campaign. But this is the first time I've played a dungeon crawl type game where I actually kept really wishing for an overlord or GM type player to take control of the enemies. It's not that the game doesn't do a good job of it. It does a decent job of controlling it and allowing the game to be cooperative. It just feels a little clunky, especially since it happens at the end of each player's turn which kind of would knock me out of what we were doing here. In addition, it can get a little weird in terms of trying to figure out which enemy is acting. I know it's supposed to be fairly straightforward, but as you saw in my overview, it to me it felt like I was just looking on the board, looking for things, and while again it works, 
it just seems to throw me out of the rhythm of the game. As far as the overall game itself, I really enjoy the story here. Now, the first time I played it, I actually read aloud the entire four pages at the beginning of the campaign book, and it really sets the mood here. And that's what I think this game is really good for. This game is good for four people who are committing to playing a campaign. The game says it's for two to four players. The thing is, at two players, each player has to control two characters. And for a lot of players, that's difficult. Even for me, who I do a lot of solo gaming, controlling multiple characters, I felt very overwhelmed going back and forth between the two characters, and it just felt like the game was kind of forcing that two player in. At three players, you play three characters, and it seems to play fine, but the ideal situation for this game really is four players who are committing to playing through the story. It's not that you can't come into the story at various points, it just really is more satisfying if you start from the beginning and go through, customizing your character as you make your way through the campaign. One other thing to note in here about the game that I, I noticed, now I had not played Undercity, previously. I watched it played so that way I would be familiar with differences. Is this game by and far largely is Undercity above ground. And that's good because that means you can take your characters from Undercity and you can play them in Widower's Wood. And I think fans of this universe and of those games are really going to like that. If you're a fan of the Iron Kingdoms universe, this is absolutely a board game that's probably going to be for you. For me personally, this was a game that I played a few stories in the campaign and then passed it on to someone else. It's not something I want to keep because honestly, I have so many other dungeon crawlers that I love that I would choose to play over this any day of the week. Descent, Imperial Assault, even Mansions of Madness. Those are games that I just like their systems better, and so I would always choose them. Again, if I was a fan of the Iron Kingdoms universe and knew more about it, this game might be higher up on my list. So overall, if you are already a fan of this universe, this is absolutely a no-brainer for you to do. If you liked Undercity, again, this is a game you're definitely going to want to take a look at. If, on the other hand, you're happy with the existing dungeon crawlers that you have and you like those systems, you might not have a reason to want to buy this game. So I would definitely recommend researching it before you do so a little more, even beyond this video. There are some excellent to play videos on the game, but that didn't really work for me because when I'm doing these, I choose to learn from the rulebook. I found the rulebook to be a hair clunky in this case. I hope this has given you a good idea of how Widower's Wood plays and whether or not it's something you might want to check out for yourself and your playgroup, and I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.